winter came to Hogwarts. The sky lightened to a dazzling opaline white, and the muddy grounds were hidden beneath a blanket of soft snow. Inside the castle, there was a buzz of Christmas in the air, marred only by worries over Professor Snape's imminent potions class. Well, we got the grapcorn horn, but last time I checked, we were still missing some of the other ingredients. We'd better go and find them before we go to Snape's class, then. I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. Welcome back, everyone, to Waterpark Rangers Let's Play Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. In the last episode, we tackled a rather short dungeon and got a new spell, Reparo. I also finally returned something or another to the Lost and Found board. The Owl Post parcel, actually. Um, and I also stood in front of it and pressed A a couple times rapidly so that we could get the next mission. Like, that's the only way, unfortunately, that you can get missions in the Lost and Found board from this point onwards. Also, on this day, something very special happens. The North Wing becomes accessible. You can't go in here at an earlier point in the game. I've tried, but that door is always locked, and it just randomly opens up on this day. The things you want to check out are right over here. First off, we've got... The Billywig card, this is the first of five normal beast cards. It's really confusing because Billywig's also a Folio Brutai page, but it's also a card in the beast set of Folio Universitas cards. In addition to that, you also want to get this right up here, the stink pellet pot that's high up on the wall. Very easy to miss. I had to scour the whole castle to find this one. And that is 19 out of 20 stink points, I believe. There's just one more of those left somewhere in the castle. Unfortunately, it's somewhere that we won't be able to access for quite a while. The North Wing, as you can see, is really quite huge. It's like a big U-shape, sort of. It bends about. And it's absolutely chock-full of bookshelves for Ron to search. So I reckon this would actually be one of the best places to grind for beans. But typically, I just like to get them earlier, and you can't get here until the third day at Hogwarts. And spoilers, unlike Chamber of Secrets, where you get five in-game days with five nights... Prisoner of Azkaban, you actually only get four in-game days and four nights, so if you can believe it, we're already like roughly around the halfway point of the game, or perhaps even further. Um, it's possible this LP is just going to be shorter than Prisoner of Azkaban was. Yeah, I mean, ugh, shorter than Chamber of Secrets was. Wow. Yeah, we're not done with Prisoner of Azkaban quite yet. It's really a shame that I think about it, like, these games, although, I mean, they're not perfect, if the other Potter games were just, they didn't get, even if the other games were just, like, not even better than these games in any sense of the word, but were just, like, about as good, this would actually be a pretty good game series overall. Like, if they just stick, if they just stuck with this formula, I mean, Nintendo never called them out about it back when it first launched, so I doubt that they'd see a problem with it if, like, Deathly Hallows had a... Zelda S gameplay that would make it a really good game. I feel a lot of people would appreciate it. Like the Deathly Hallows game was pretty much universally panned by everyone who played it, except the very stupid who contest that oh it's so good because they copy an actual good series like like uh, the CLD. No, my friend, that's not how it works. There's already plenty of shooter clones. The world doesn't need another one. <laughs> and unfortunately, whoever worked on the Deathly Hallows games thought differently, very differently. I do like the winter uh, weather of this game. What is a problem though is that you can't tell this because I took out all the load times, but the load times for um, like when the when it becomes winter outside, the load times show it is spring, and later on when it becomes spring the load times show the, the grounds is winter and it really bothers me. Like they couldn't get that little detail straight. So because Ron can't ride Buckbeak, we're gonna have to switch to someone who can. Because what we're going to do now is seek out the potion ingredients for Snape's class. And they're all around the Hogwarts grounds. You'll find them all outdoors. Besides the Horn of the Graphorn. You actually get the Horn of the Graphorn as soon as Ron joins your party um, during the Black Deed section of the game. Like, if you check your inventory right after Ron joins you, you'll have the Graphorn horn already. Like, it doesn't just appear after the cutscene where he reveals he has it. It's in your inventory as soon as he joins the party, which is really cool, actually. So the first location over here, all these, like, lights from God help Harry Potter, the warlock, the enemy of God. <laughs> if you've ever seen Jesus Camp, you'll know what I'm referring to. Find the ingredients he needs for his new satanic potion. Unfortunately, it seems like Ron and Hermione are being very slow in following us. Um, seems like they're always the slowest if you try and take off in the hippogriff. This is the venomous tentacula. Apparently, it was its hitbox was so awkwardly programmed that it just 
It bit right through our body, and we took, like, no damage at all. Hey, Normally, it's supposed to knock you over, and you do take a little bit of damage. Now, you can, you can press L at any time to call for uh, Ron and Hermione, which is what I've been doing. Um, I've done it at a couple other times during the LP, but never really explicitly pointed it out. It has its uses, but check out how quickly they run to you, like, across the grounds. It wasn't too easy to tell from there, but sometimes, whenever I'm running across the grounds, I like to look back and realize and appreciate just how quickly Ron and Hermione chase after you. Or, you know, the other two members of your party, whoever you happen to be playing as. They really like their running sprite really speeds up to try to make up the distance. Now here's another enemy that we got a Folio Brutai page for. The Chiz Purple. It's really hard to see, but it looks almost like something you could find right out of Pikmin. Or Pikmin 3 is the case it may be because the character model is actually slightly more detailed. Don't You don't have any idea how, um, how difficult it's been for me to like just not straight up watch a full playthrough of Pikmin 3. I gotta keep it somewhat fresh for when I play it. I guess this is another version, another use of Lumos Duo. Kind of like the opposite of the Bogger. I'm, I mean, the opposite of the Ghoul that, like, walks away backwards from you. The Chisperful just follows you. So what you need to do is lure the Chispervils one by one, or to a Venomous Tentacula. At first, only this one's open. When it gets close enough, it'll eat the Venomous Tentacula. It'll, I mean, it'll eat the Chisperful, spit it out, and we can pick up the Chisperful Carapace. That means we have two more to get. I'm also not sure whether or not the Chisperful can hurt you or not, but they sure act... Very antagonistic when you get close to them. Anyhow, after you feed um, one Chisperful to the first Venomous Tentacula, the other one also wakes up, and it will be ready to eat as well. I find it kind of ironic and funny that the uh, Venomous Tentacula's plant-based enemies only seem to appear, like they start growing as soon as winter sets in and all the plants should not be growing. But oh well, maybe they just work that way because they're special magic plants. And I know there are actually some plants that do grow better in winter, but those are real rarities. Like, there are some plants, I know, um, there's some kind of flower that can grow without benefit of sunlight. Um, like, sunlight's actually bad for it. But then again, I'm not sure, look, strictly speaking, how different it is from a normal flower. I am not an herbologist, that is Neville's job. And I mean normal Neville, not bootleg Harry Potter game Neville. So, I think that does it. We don't have any more Chisperfuls to get, we have all three carapaces. Now I'm, I'm also going to show you how Hermione can fly on Buckbeak as well, and it's not just Harry. This is some tangible evidence, in case you didn't believe me for whatever reason. Now, unfortunately, Buckbeak can't be used to run over Venomous Tentaculas or squash, squash Chiz Purples or do anything cool like that. The one enemy that really Buckbeak helps you to get are the Billywigs. Billywigs were mentioned in the Folio Brutai and also earlier this episode when we got the first normal Beast card. It's just called the Beast set. Um, they're very simple, you just kind of fly into them. Remember the bats? It's like that, but easier. They resemble manhacks from Half-Life, or if you count these things as different enemies, but they're not. I mean, there's enemies in Jack 2. They're metalheads. I forget what they're called, though. But they look just like manhacks from Half-Life. And if you're wondering what a manhack looks like, it's essentially what we just flew into. Like, there's all these enemies in completely different gaming series that just happen to look the same. But Billywigs are definitely the weirdest of them because I don't think they can even hurt you in any shape, way, or form. They just kind of fly around and they were something to collect and they happen to look like enemies that actually hurt you from two vastly different game series. Jack and Daxter and a Half-Life series. So I'm just taking a little... This There's no point in me doing this except to show you just like all the cool places you can fly Buckbeak. A lot of people really like flying a Buckbeak in this game and I am no exception. I think it's quite fun. He's not as fast as the Nimbus 2000 from Chamber of Secrets but he's still really cool. He's got his own weird way of flying, and you never have to do, like, Buckbeak racing or any anything like that. I actually rewatched a part of that LP just so I could remind myself about how the Neville minigames were, and I, forget, I forgot that they actually made you pay more and more money to race against other people. Like, that's the dumbest thing. They should be paying you for doing those races. They honestly should be paying you and Beans as a reward for doing those minigames. I actually really like the backgrounds, like, far in the distance, like, the landscapes around Hogwarts Castle. I think that's really cool. I like how you can fly under the bridges and stuff. It's actually one of the better aspects of this game. I figured that if I didn't have at least one segment of us riding Buckbeak randomly around the Hogwarts Castle, then I wouldn't be giving the, you the authentic Prisoner of Azkaban experience, because when I was a kid, that was one of the things I liked more about this game. There was a certain part that once I was in there and I saved, I couldn't continue because I just couldn't beat it. We're coming up on that in a couple episodes. 
But I really enjoyed, like, the sections where you could fly in Buckbeak earlier because they gave you the biggest sense of freedom, and it was, like, the opposite of the claustrophobic dungeon that I hated. Also, I just showed you that you could jump off a cliff there, and it does a lot of damage to whoever you're controlling. So, yeah, that can happen. But that won't happen if you're especially cautious. Man, just look at the great textures on those trees. <laughs> I swear they had better looking trees in Ocarina of Dime easily. It's a little disappointing, honestly. I mean, come on, man, this is GameCube. Whenever I see, like, a console that just, like, it doesn't even do, like, half of what it was supposed to do graphically, it makes me a little upset. I mean, I'm not entirely against this game's graphics. I kind of like the style. If anything, it reminds me of Twilight Princess. It's clear they wanted to make it more realistic looking than the Chamber of Secrets game was. And I can't really fault them for it. Prisoner of Azkaban was in some ways a more mature story because it was a little bit less simple than defeating a giant snake with a sword. Um, it was a bit more symbolic and things like the Dementors. I guess the Dementors were kind of meant to represent everything that were... They were like the anti-humans in a way. Um, if you've ever read the Aragon series, the Dementors are really similar to the Razak. Those creatures that are kind of meant to be like... The things that prey on humans. Dementors are sort of like that in the Harry Potter series. And bringing them... Making them the real antagonists of a story. Like, kind of... It's not Voldemort. Like, Voldemort plays the least role in this story out of all the Harry Potter stories. And yet, it's one of the better ones, actually. Um, I mean, Deathly Hallows is probably my favorite Harry Potter story. And Goblet of Fire is also really good. But Prisoner of Azkaban... It's up there. Man, I don't know. I guess I'd have to be very... I'd have to take a second and think about, like where I'd rank the Potter series. Obviously, Order of the Phoenix is the bottom of the list, not just because the movie sucked, but because the book was actually the worst of the books. The longest one, too. I mean, the book itself even pointed out how long it was. Like, if you look in the little, um, the sleeve that covers Order of the Phoenix, it says, the plot runs thick, as well as the spine. Haha, ha, but no, really, it's honestly too long of a book, and it seriously could have used some editing, because there's just some points that don't particularly add anything to the story, and overall, it's just kind of filler. I mean, the part where they go into the Ministry of Magic and go into the Department of Mysteries is really cool in the book. But unfortunately, like, the movie just replaced that with them running through, like, a Lowe's warehouse filled with balls. It was the dumbest thing ever. The two good things about the Prisoner of Azkaban movie. Um, whoever played Umbridge was really, really spot on. Fantastic. Obviously, Alan Rickman, you can't fault him, nor whoever it is that plays Filch, who's also really good. But the fight between Dumbledore and Voldemort's kind of cool, I guess. Other than that, there's really, like, hardly any redeeming factors. Also, there's a moment, Baron of WoW always reminds me of this, where Voldemort just, like, kind of appears, like, in Harry's mind, and goes, literally, he just points his fingers at him and goes, like, Acha! like he's from West Side Story or something, like, finishing a musical number. So I came down here because I wanted to give Harry more Wigan Web potions. I'm not going to spoil this, we're probably not going to end up having to use them, but I'm showing us doing this because I recommend, if you're playing this game for the first time, um, I'm pretty experienced with it, so I basically know how to work things and get through certain puzzles and battles more easily. But the more Wigan World potions you have on Harry's person, the better. Like, and also the fact that Ron has a lot stocked, um, and his person is really good as well. And the last part of this episode is just going to be cutscene in Snape's class, so I'm not going to talk during that. So, after that, we're going to have a long dungeon. Until then, mischief managed. And, as you can see, combine to form the antidote to uncommon poisons. Which can be administered to cure such things as the venomous bite of a doxy. Now, I would like you to gather together the following ingredients in time for our next lesson. Flying seahorses, doxy eggs, toasted dragonfly thoraxes, and fairy wings. We will be using these ingredients to make the girding potion. Class dismissed.